So you ask the most important question in strategy, which is not what is true, but what would have to be true. So you say of the first, uh, first uh, uh, option or possibility, as I, as I uh, uh, call it, what would have to be true about the customer? What would have to be true about our capabilities? What would have to be true about the competition for that to be a great idea? And you ask that of each of the, of, of the possibilities. So you have a list of the important things that would have to be true for that to be the best idea. Okay, and then you choose the one that has the highest number of things that are likely to be true? Uh, not, not quite. I don't go there quite. How do you I take it asked, from there? Uh, I, I asked of the things that would have to be true, which of the ones which are we most worried are not true? Ah, good one. And those are the barriers, what I call the barriers to choice, because if there's something that would have to be true that you're saying, I don't think that's true, you're never going to okay. go do that, right? Okay. So, so it's then, after you've identified those barriers, you figure out how you can test them. Today, we're talking with Roger Martin, Rider Strategy Advisor, and in 2017, was named the number one management thinker in the world. He's former dean and institute director of the Martin Prosperity Institute at the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto in Canada. He's a trusted strategy advisor to the CEOs of companies worldwide, including Procter & Gamble, Lego, and Ford. And he's the author of 12 books, including Playing to Win, How Strategy Really Works. Today, we'll be talking about how to develop a strategy that wins in competitive markets. And just quickly, before we get started, make sure to go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you get the latest episodes as soon as they're released. Now, let's get into it. Hey, Roger, and welcome. Hey, it's great to be with you. Thank you Yeah, for I'm excited me. about this chat because it's all about strategy, which I would say is arguably the most misunderstood area in the world when it comes to business. So let's just get straight into it by defining strategy. How do you define strategy? Sure. Uh, I define it as uh, choices, making choices to do some things and not others. Uh, and I see it as an integrative set of choices uh, that define uh, where you're going to play and how are you going to win where you've chosen uh, to play. Um, why it's misunderstood, I think, is it's become very much an exercise in planning. And strategy and planning are two different things. Right? You can plan to do a lot of things and you can have very detailed plans to do a lot of things and you can do all of those things and it still won't end up being a winning strategy. Uh, and I've, I've in, in my view, because planning is, is something you can be certain that you do right, right? As long as you're like dutiful and thorough, you'll have a plan. Uh, but to have a strategy that wins requires creativity. It cre uh, requires trying to create a future that is better than the, the, the present. And that is not an easily doable thing. And so most people, most of the time, default to planning. And so there's very little great strategy done in the world. And this is a big one, right? Because it is to choose like where to play, that's a big one, and how to win. Yeah, so it's those two things, right? And that's the very hard is, strategy to call it. But what's interesting about strategy is that it assumes a competitor, right? It assumes there's a competitive landscape. Is that right? No, no. I mean, the many entrepreneurs create kind of a new where to play, and they win by being the only player on that field so um that that sometimes happens now that's accidental though right that's accidental they accidentally found a place where they could win right not necessarily i mean that's 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 entrepreneurial beauty is sort of you know figure, figuring out figuring out uh some some need that is not being met that you can uh you can meet and and uh now what tends to happen is that somebody will uh, enter that space. I mean, if it's a really stupid idea and nobody's buying it and you're not, <laughs> money, they'll leave, they'll leave you to it until you run out of money. But if it's, if it's clever and it turns out that, pe that, uh, that people buy and you make a lot of money, then you can be sure others will enter and it will no longer be a, a monopoly. Um, 
but I, 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 I would just, I would just say it's not by definition, you have a, you have a competitor in essence, when, when you're developing something entirely new, right? The competitor is doing without, right? Uh, it, you know, it, the, the very, very first car did not have a direct competitor, but it had doing without a horse-drawn uh, carriage. And what you had to do is convince consumers to forego th uh, the current product, the current offering, and go with this entirely uh, new thing, which is a challenge. It's a slightly different challenge than saying, my car is better than your car. Uh, but it still requires you to have a value proposition for the user that causes them to choose it rather than something else. So the where to play um, is the market segment and the how to win is like how you're going to put all the resources together to focus on that segment. Is that the best way to think about it? Absolutely. Though, though there are many sort of... Uh, attributes to that market segment, right? You, you could say it's this kind of consumer, high-end or low-end consumers. You could say it's Australian yeah. uh, consumers or, or American consumers. Um, you, you, could, you could also uh, say your where to play is, is what stage of the, if you will, the value system you, you're in. Are you going to be in the downstream part? So you're going to produce and market and distribute, or maybe you're going to produce and sell through a different distribution channel, or maybe you're going to backward integrate into the raw materials. So there are a bunch of different kind of where uh, choices that, that get into it. But your idea of a segment is is not at all a bad uh, de description. And I'm, I'm thinking gonna... where on the playing field, the entire possible playing field, are you going to plop yourself down and say, that is where I'm going to uh, uh, concentrate my efforts. And we're going to get into all these parts and I'm going to ask questions that may seem simple, but that's just how I work. Like I like to just constantly check, is it like this? Is it like that? And if it's not, I'm not upset if you say no, it's not, it's not like that. Okay. <laughs> well, when it comes to strategy, getting specific like this is important because it's, again, as you said, it's misunderstood and done poorly generally. Yeah. And so you talked before about um, strategy and planning and like I read in, one of your posts on your 20 part series on medium, which is highly recommended. It's anyone just 25, out on medium. Now. 25 now, 25. Well, it was 20 parts and then it was 25. Excellent it's stuff. <laughs> Sorry. It's once a week. So as of Monday, it'll be 26. Uh, okay. It's once a week. Well, that's going to be uh, the 13th book. You talked about there's a confusion between strategy and planning. And when people want to create a strategy, but it's a plan. They call it a strategic plan. Can yes. you just kind of unpack that quickly? Because I know this will be happening everywhere. Yes. Yes. Well, I mean, there's a general view that that strategy is some kind of a cool thing. And so it's often used as a modifier to make something sound cool, right? Strategic sourcing, strategic procurement, you know, and so planning sounds kind of boring. So call it strategic uh, mm. uh, plan. Um, and again, uh, uh, as I say in the piece you, you, you referred to, you know, strategy and planning are complements, not substitutes. They're treated as substitutes. As long as we have a plan that explains the stuff we're going to do, we're going to call that our strategic uh, plan. But unless it adds up to here's where we're going to play and here's how we're going to win, then, then it doesn't deserve the modifier uh, uh, strategic uh, because it isn't, it isn't, a strategy in the sense that I believe the the term was was uh, coined. Uh, I mean, the the term originally came from from the world of the military, right? Which mm. and there's a long, rich history from Sun Tzu to Van mm. of, of saying, "Here's here's the you know, kind of techniques for thinking about how to win a battle," and we're going to call that military strategy, and and that eventually got imported to business uh, uh, as a this is our this is our approach, our theory of the case that will enable us to achieve the thing we would like to uh, achieve, and that um, strategy. Yeah, sure. And so, just to clarify the first point, which was a strategy is 
um, a selection of the place to play and how to win. Yeah. So that's the first part. A plan is the list of things to do in sequential order to achieve something. And sometimes the confusion is just creating a list of things to do in sequential order it does not mean it's a strategy because you haven't chosen the place to play and how to win in that specific area. You got it. See, these are not simple questions. These are yeah, but I just wanted just to clarify them, make sure I've got it. And also just for the listeners as well. Right. And the second part, and this is, <laughs> no, I was, giving, I was giving you credit. <laughs> so, thank you. I like credits. Um, the second part um, was like, and this is just a quick, a quick side note because I'm interested um, specifically in this topic, but how does the military definition of strategy relate to the, to the business definition and how closely related are they? Well, I, I, I think they're, there's some kind of family resemblance, but they aren't, aren't uh, the same thing. And, in, and in fact, right. The, the, uh, strategies evolved from from away from military strategy because if you think about military strategy and you ask what what mattered in military uh, strategy what really mattered is us so our capabilities versus that of the competitor and what we were going to do what they were going to do and how those two things were going to interact now there's a consumer, if you will, in the equation only to the extent that if, if your military strategy is to respond to an attack on your homeland, then you're just going to assume the consumers would rather have you, uh, the, the consumers who are the citizens would rather have yeah. you repel the invader than not. You don't spend a lot of time thinking, well, do you really want and what exactly would you like? And how? <laughs> no, okay. you just. You just go do it, uh, uh, do it. Or, or if if you are the invading force, it's because your citizens have, have some sense said, well, that's okay if you do that, or we'd like you to do that, or, or, or Parliament, uh, you know, approved approved it. So, so the consumer wasn't, and customer was not very much in the in the equation. Uh, but it was just assumed that you were doing something good, good uh, uh, for them. And the question was, can you beat the enemy? How do, you, how do you go about uh, doing that overwhelming force? You're going to be clever. You're going to flank them, da, 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 you know, what, uh, uh, whatever. And so in the world of business, that's how strategy in many respects started uh, with very little concern for the customer. Mm. And it was how would you get, I mean, the, in some sense, the father of modern strategies, Bruce Henderson, the founder of Boston Consulting uh, Group, and, and his, his strategy was, you know, you, in, you uh, uh, invest ahead of the learning curve, price ahead of the learning curve, below your, your cost if necessary to get the dominant scale so that your costs will always be lower and you will win, right? That, that, that was it. The, con, the customer wasn't in that equation kind of at, at all. It was about you and the competitor and how you were going to get ahead of the competitor. As it evolved, it became more interested in the, the consumer, the customer. And that's where, in some sense, the where to play, or at least in my version of strategy, the where to play comes. It's like, ooh, it, it it's like in the case of a country, it's sort of for all citizens. You're mm. defending the whole land. No, it's for this set of customers. Uh, uh, we we want to tussle with the with the competition uh, uh, for oh, and then what must they need? How we, can we serve their needs, etc. Yeah. So so it's migrated away from from military strategy in 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 that sense. The other thing I would say about military strategy is there's, it's a little more clear that there is a absolute winner and an absolute loser, right, at the end of it. And I see the evolution of, of business strategy more being, more being I'm going to head over here and these are my customers that I'm going to serve better than anybody else. And that'll cause you to stay away from those customers because serving them does you no good because you serve them less well than, than than I do, and so I win. But you go over there and serve those customers, and and that's fine with me. I'm I'm not I'm not gonna I'm 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 not gonna be upset with you. I'm not gonna battle you. So there's a little more in business strategy of many uh, uh, companies succeeding, but in different places and in different in different ways. Got it. So 
it's far less adversarial and there's far less like damage at the end of it um, for one side or for the other, depending on. Yeah. The if place people that have really clever, yeah. If people have really clever strategies where you get more, the moral equivalent of death and destruction, right. Mm. People just wasting their money on endless battles or whatever is when companies don't really have a strategy for winning. They just have a strategy for competing. Uh, and uh, and they compete endlessly, bashing each other over the over the head for no good good reason. So the best strategy now, great military strategists would say the best military strategies involve not much death and destruction either, because you cleverly outflank your competitor, and they just say, "Oops, uh, you win, we lose." Yeah. Uh, and it, it, it's World War One where you, nobody has a decisive right, and you just line up. And keep shooting each other and killing and killing each other for you know kind of no no particularly useful uh, outcome. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think this goes to the, to the next part now, which in um, you just mentioned it um, is how to create a strategy to win. Mm-hmm. A strategy to win. Yeah, and this and that specifically with business again. So let's get back to business. Um, yes. What do you need to create a winning strategy? Well, I think you need uh, a, a lot of understanding of the customer so that, that you can figure out what capabilities you can build that would be hard to replicate to serve those customers in, in a unique way. Right? And that, that is kind of the, the, the essence of, this, of the strategy. You have to deploy, build and deploy capabilities that are hard to replicate against a, a cert- meeting a customer need in a particular way. If you can do that, you'll have a strategy that uh, uh, that succeeds. And how do you find that place? Uh, say, for example, we're talking about the customer, right? And so we want to go into a specific segment. We know who the customer is. We we do some surveys with them, but we interview them and so on or whatever. Like we do some. Um, uh, some qualitative surveys, right? Uh, so we have an understanding now like, of the customer, right? So now with that information, like, what do we now, like, what's the next step? Yeah, like, like is it to see the size of the market? Like, is it to identify the, like, like what's no, the next step? Up. Yeah, it's, it, it's at this point, this is, this is the <laughs> creative act. It's, it's to say, what's a theory for how I might serve the, that customer segment better than anybody uh, else. What are they missing, right? Is there something that they long for that they, that they don't uh, uh, currently uh, have? Or if they're getting stuff right now, is it, at, is it at a cost to them, a price that's so high that uh, they, they buy less than they would otherwise and aren't particularly uh, kind of uh, thrilled with that. And we could create a different economic structure that would enable us to sell it. But it's, it, it is having a theory, a theory of how we could serve them better. And what I'd say is, is and this is this, I take a page out of the d- design world, come up with multiple theories, right? Dream up. Get a bunch of people to come up with, with a variety of theories. Don't just fixate very, very quickly on one, but come up with, with, an, with uh, a number that you can then test out the logic of to say, which of these do we think has the best chance of, of creating a win uh, with, that, with that customer uh, base? And so this, this is are, why um... it's not like planning, right? Planning, anybody can do. Anybody who's thorough can do it. Strategy requires you to be creative, to be inventive about how you come up with that theory. And so these are the, um, the how might we questions. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so just for the listeners, could you just explain that? Sure. Sure. So, so what I say about strategy, strategy is a problem solving uh, uh, tool. And, and the, the way you started is to say, well, What's the problem we'd like to solve? And a good way to frame that problem is a how might we question, which is which comes from the world of of of, uh, of design, which which is which is to say, well, um, here's a problem. The customers are experiencing the following. How might we 
make that better for the for the, the customers uh, mm-hmm. or or perhaps we used to have those customers you know absolutely in our pocket they used to love us and now they seem to be loving somebody else that's the problem how might we uh, uh, regain the kind of the position with the customers that we that we did uh, before so you need that sort of motivating question that that imagines a better future that, that provides in some sense the objective function, if you will, so that you can tell whether a theory will actually deliver, has the potential of delivering against your, how might we question that would then solve the, solve the problem. How many possibilities should a, should a strategist or should a strategy session come up with? You know, like, like how many is a good minimum to be thinking about? Three, three to five, I think. Unless you, unless you have a minimum of, of three, you've, you've probably not, not thought broadly enough, and there's probably something that you're missing that's, that's good. I think five is a, is a good number. Typically, and those options are very different. Those five yeah. options are very different. So they have to be completely different, but they can't be similar with a bit of a tweak, right? They need to be different. I prefer them to be uh, significantly different because because I think so. Let's imagine you have five, and there there you know, and there's go east, go west, go north, go yep. go. go, go. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, let's say four, <laughs> and um, I think that as you move through a, a process of evaluating them and get to the point of you know westerly looks good, that vector looks good. I think then you can say, oh, oh, it's a couple degrees kind of northerly or a couple degrees uh, uh, southerly. But if you never had west in the consideration set, you, you'll never get you'll never get mm-hmm. there. You'll settle for north, south, or or uh, uh, east. Um, so so that's why I, I I like kind of real variety in terms of really different ways of of winning, different ways of solving the problem that you've identified. And you know that they are going to be uh, five solid choices if they outline uh, basically where to play and how to win in the same statement. Is that correct? That is correct. That is correct. And it does not have to be the same where to play for each of them. That was my next question because I was about to ask it like, because there could be lots of different options and often there are. Absolutely. One of the one of the things that 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 I would say identifies kind of great strategy is it was there there was that that kind of flexibility in both the 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 heart of strategy I call the heart of strategy the where to play how to win pair of choices um, and and the worst strategy comes from saying we've decided on our where to play and now let's see how could we win there or we've decided on a way to win, where could we play? What, what that does is sub-optimize. It gets you to what people who talk about optimization theory say is a local peak, right? It's like you get to the top of the 10th tallest mountain in the Himalayas, not mm. Everest. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and if you allow the two to vary together so that you find, Ooh, this is a where to play. That's perfect for our, how to win. This is a, how to win. Uh, uh, that's perfect for our, where to play. Uh, then you get a great strategy. And we're going to go through this process of, through this call, but just, I'm just trying to understand this, this selection criteria, you know, the, how might we questions that are linked to, to where to play and how to win. Now, a company could have, five segments that they could go after, right? And they're going to be smaller segments where their mm-hmm. strategy of the where to, to play and the how to, to win, they would be different per segment. Should they just choose one segment to go after or can they go after three or could they go after all five because they're kind of like different segments themselves? How do you think about this part? Yeah, no, no. It, it it depends on on whether the how to win is made stronger or weaker by going after all the segments. So, mm. so if there are some similarities uh, um, uh, across the segments that allow you to invest in capabilities that can be used to serve all seven, then it may be the smartest possible thing to be in all seven. Mm. Whereas if they're all quite different, 
then chances are it's weakening your, your uh, how to win to play across them. So just to give a concrete example, right? Procter Please. & Gamble, company I've, company I've worked with for kind of a, kind of a long period of time, big business in, yeah. in, in Australia yes. and, and in New Zealand, uh, uh, they're in 10 categories, right? From male shaving to female uh, protection products to baby care to hair care to skin care, et cetera. Um, and I would argue they're stronger for it. Mm -hmm. uh, why? It's because they tend to go through the same distribution channels, right? And yep. so you can go to your distribution partner and say, hey, here's all the things we can do, uh, uh, do for you uh, together. Uh, they're all consumer branded uh, goods. And so you advertise in, in the same places and you can have advertising uh, uh, scale. So there's a, a number of things that make it sensible for them to be in all of those. But not too long ago, uh, they divested. They they were they had a ethical pharmaceutical business, right? Mm -hmm. A, a, a uh, uh, you know kind of uh, uh, FDA uh, approved drugs. Yes. And they thought they thought they bought the a company called Norton. They was paid a couple billion dollars for it because they thought, hey, you know, we can bring up all our consumer packaged goods branding experience to this. But kind of what they found is it goes through a completely different distribution channel, right? Detailing doctors, mm, don't do that, right? Uh, we'd have to build our own little sales force for our own little company and go against the sales forces of Pfizer and Glaxo and all, mm -hmm. these, all these giants. And oh, by the way, there's this, there's this step in the whole process of getting a drug in front of a customer that involves going through the FDA or the equivalent in, in Australia and Canada and, mm -hmm. and, and the EU. And as our little, relatively little pharma company, uh, we do that once every couple of years and Pfizer does it once a week and no, not quite once a week but yeah. is with them wow they're really good at that because uh, there's an art to the, to, uh, to that we're we're not so good so even though procter and gamble had a theory about how this would be a good idea it wasn't a strong enough theory uh yes they had advantage in branding when they had a product they were better at branding it than the pharma pharma uh companies and the like but on a bunch of other features they were just not nearly as good. Mm -hmm. And so they sold it. They sold it actually for a profit, right? They made, some, they made some money on it because they did a pretty good job with it, but it wasn't something where they could be number one, which is what they want in each of their categories. They want to be number one in every category in which they, they compete. That was not going to happen in our lifetime, yep. if ever. And so, so there would be a case where one segment too many. Too right? many, got it. Uh, um, or one segment that was too different uh, for, uh, for it to be uh, a good thing. So you just mentioned um, to be number one in the category. Is that a checkpoint for the strategy that is a good strategy that, that you should be going for at least a large enough, I say market share for that category, for that to be a good strategy? I'm more, you know, over time, as I've, as I've done this for 40 years now, hmm. I'm getting more and more convinced that you need to pick a where in which you, you will aspire to be number one in that, in, in, in share. Now, that does not mean that you utilize somebody else's categorization scheme. Right. So, so if somebody else says, uh, you know, whoa, you're not number one in, you know, kind of automobiles, that may not be the right, the right segment. You may be, you may be kind of number five in that, but in the luxury space of your or Mercedes brand, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're, they're not, maybe they're, uh, they're probably just barely top 10 in market share in auto, you know, automobiles, but mm. in the certain luxury space, uh, they are number one. Mm. So, so what you, and now you can't have that be fake. It's sort of like, well, I'm going to call my space this when I, that's not really my space. You have to, you have to be realistic about it, but I think there is a realistically defined luxury auto space uh, that has its own set of, uh, competitors, competitive brands, uh, and, and Mercedes can be number one in, uh, uh, in that. 
I think you can even say, right, that for luxurious luxury automobiles, they're number one. For ultimate driving machines, right, BMW is, right? Mm. So those segments aren't exactly the same, the same segments. And in each, in each, I think it would be fair to say they have a right to say, no, for those particular customers, we're it. And that's what you should strive for in your, in your strategy, that you can identify a set of customers that say, you're better than others. Are you like, would we never, ever in a million years buy the other? No, if it was cheap enough or whatever, but given our preference, we'd buy you. You want to be able to say that for uh, a, a big enough group of customers to make your business model work. And so oftentimes, if it's a very large market, it's just going to a sub-segment of that market and finding what's important to them. And you're not creating a category as such, but you're, but you're just kind of identifying a segment within a larger category, um, which you can just kind of step into with better strategy, marketing, and so on um, to win. Is that right? Like, like, is that how to think no, about no, it? No. That, that, that's, that's exactly right. And, 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 and it is a really, really important part of, of strategy because you have to have that, that aspiration, I, I think. Uh, mm. So, you know, and part of the way I think about strategies, you've got to have a winning aspiration that, that, that uh, helps you pick a where to play and a how to win. So you have that, that team, and then you build the capabilities necessary to win where you've chosen to play to meet your yep. winning aspiration. And you develop a set of management systems that build and maintain those capabilities to win where you've chosen to play to meet your winning uh, aspiration. So it's a big part of strategy is just figuring out, figuring out how you are going to follow through on an aspiration, not to just participate, but to win. Yeah, but you see, but you see, this relates back to what I said about business strategy being a little bit different than than uh, than uh, military strategy. You're not trying to kill the competition; you're trying to convince the competition to compete elsewhere. Mm. That that that's what you want more than anything else to have your competition say say, you know, I'm going to be the ultimate driving machine for people who really really care about that style of performance. Yeah. Fine. Okay. Leave to us this sort of more luxurious, uh, luxury German and engineering for sort of this ult ultimate uh, luxury. If you leave that alone, we'll leave you alone. We'll both coexist, happy. We both make money. Everything's good. Yeah. And the good thing, right, is it's great for customers, right? Yeah. They they, they have what they have real choice. Mm. It's not, this is not the Soviet Union. This is not, you will get this and it'll all look the same. This is, you will have, you will have a, a real choice. That's why, that's why strategy, in my view, is, is and should be a positive force for humanity. Yeah. Strategy should be a positive force in helping customers get served well, right? And have resources deployed to create things that customers love uh, that earn enough for shareholders to keep wanting to invest in that. And that creates jobs, right? Uh, and uh, which creates uh, kind of uh, people with, with, with money to, yeah. to have the economy kind of uh, grow. So yeah. bad strategy where everybody converges on doing the same thing and you get this sort of destructive competition, commoditization, whatever is just is bad for the world. Sure. I agree with that. I'm just trying to put it into a structure so that I, at the end yeah. of this, I've created a good story for the listeners. Now, so we've done the how might we questions. We've got five options now, right? Now they could all be completely like, like in like separate directions. Now, how do we choose? How do we choose which is the best likelihood of success? And that if we were to succeed, the winning would be worth it. Sure. So you ask the most important question in strategy, which is not what is true, but what would have to be true. So you say of the first, uh, first uh, uh, option or possibility, as I, as I uh, uh, call it, what would have to be true about the customer? What would have to be true about our capabilities? What would have to be true about the competition for that to be a great idea? And you ask that of each of the, of, of the possibilities. So you have a list of the important things that would have to be true for that to be the best idea. Okay. And then you choose the one that has the highest number of 
things that are likely to be true? Uh, not, not quite. I don't go there quite. How do you I then take asked, it from there? I, I asked of the things that would have to be true, which of the ones which are we most worried are not true? Ah, good one. And those are the barriers, what I call the barriers to choice, because if there's something that would have to be true that you're saying, I don't think that's true, you're never going to go <laughs> do that, right? Okay. So, so it's then, after you've identified those barriers, you figure out how you can test them. How you can test them. How, can you do some market research? Can you do some competitive analysis? Can you do some analysis of your capabilities uh, and the like? You, you, you create some kind of a test that would enable you to assess, can you overcome that barrier, right? Is, is actually, now that you've checked it, that, that is okay. Or now that you've checked it, you think you could take this set of actions that would make that barrier go away. And when you've done that for all the possibilities, you do choose the one that you feel most confident you can make true the things that would need to be true for that to be the best idea. Mm. That is your choice. That is the choice. And so how long does this process typically take? It depends on, on how much testing you want to do. So Coming up with the how might we, coming up with where to play, how to win uh, poss possibilities is not terribly time consuming. There's no good reason why you couldn't go and do an offsite for a couple or three days and come up with those and to reverse engineer them to ask what would have to be true and uh, identify what are the things that would have to be true or we was worried about might not be true. That mm. doesn't take long. You can do that in a matter of days or at most weeks. Mm. Then the question is, how much time, money, resources, et cetera, do you want to spend on testing? Mm. See, if it's just you and your buddy in a garage dreaming up a new business, you may say, what the hell? We think, we think this is a good enough pos a chance of this succeeding. We're just going to go do it. Mm. Right? Um, if you're a large public co uh, company, mm. uh, you know, you know Telstra mm. uh, or, or, or something yeah. with a board of directors and all these yeah. shareholders, yeah. They will probably say, we'd like you to do a bunch of consumer research. Oh, and that'll take six months or nine months. Or, or we'd like you to do this big modeling exercise on, on what competitors might do and what we might be able to do. Or we'd like you to build a prototype or something. So, so what I try to do is take the process of creating a strategy and divide it into two parts. The logic part, that's what's the problem we want to solve. What are possibilities for, for solving it? What would have to be true? What, what are the barriers? That's the logical structure. Yep. Uh, and I try to separate that from the analytical part so that the company in question can say, depending on how much demonstration we need, how much, how much testing we need, that'll determine how long we're willing to take on this and how much we're willing to, to uh, spend on it. And, and companies have a kind of different, uh, different attitudes towards that. It seems like the bigger the risk associated with it, the more time should be put into testing it out. Is that right? Or like the bigger the investment and the longer the execution is typically going to take? Yeah, those would all be factors. I wouldn't say there's any one. So okay. yes, the, the bigger the risk, but it depends on kind of what you mean by risk. So what I often say is there's a difference between something that's below the waterline or above the waterline. So it, you know, I will always ask the question, well, if this fails, if we try possibility C and it fails, are we... Uh, you know, did we just take a torpedo below the waterline or did we mm. take, take one above the, above the waterline and we can limp back to port and fix it up and go back out to, out to sea. So part of it, so that is a measure of, of, uh, of risk. Part of it is how much is it all or nothing, right? Could you test in, in small ways that wouldn't be terribly expensive and then, you know, kind of prototype it? try it out in one market segment again that and, and then learn from uh, uh from that so a lot about it is is trying to figure out ways of of getting answers to your questions and this is where again i i like the practice of design iterative prototyping 
mm -hmm. right? To say you go out with a prototype and 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 test it in the market, get feedback, improve it, improve it, so that so that by the time you have to launch in full, yeah. you have much more much more data and, and in insight into how customers are going to react to it. So lots of that to me is is you know a skill at figuring out how you enable the world to be to be kind of de-risked for uh, for you yeah uh, and, and i think that's what that, that's what clever entrepreneurs uh do lots of people think of entrepreneurs as these uh, like incredibly wild-eyed people who jump off you know tall tall buildings uh, <laughs> with maybe a parachute and maybe it was just a knapsack. Right. Yeah. And, and, uh, that's not my experience, uh, uh, at all. Um, I helped the guy he's, 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 uh, passed away now. Ted Rogers is Canada's sort of greatest tech entrepreneur in history, uh, and has built the, you know, not like Telstra, right? He's, he's built a competitor to Bell Canada that's now bigger than Bell, Bell Canada and just did a $28 billion merger to become the biggest. Wow. So he is this entrepreneur and, and the situation was uh, getting the, there was a going to be two national uh, cellular licenses uh, to be handed out. This was in the early 1980s, 82, as I recall, but it might've been 83. Mm. Uh, and one was given to Bell Canada, the, the historic monopoly. And then the other was up for, up for grabs. And so here's Ted Rogers, who had already was the, uh, uh, FM radio. He, he brought FM radio to Canada, made a, made a mint cable TV made a mint. Uh, so he was already rich. Maybe I'm not sure if he's a billionaire yet, but it was probably, probably pretty close. Mm. And it was going to take about a million dollars in cash outlay to go through the process to put together all the studies that were required and whatever, a million dollars. What did Ted Rogers do? Went to two other wealthy families in Canada and split it three ways. Right? And you're saying, let me get this straight. This guy who's at least a centimillionaire and maybe a billionaire mm. can't, can't a risk a million dollars on getting the national cellular license for a G7 country? Nope. Took it down to 333. Mm. They were not favored, but they, but they won the bid. What did Ted Rogers do then? Turned around to Ameritech, which is one of the seven baby bells. They've all been yep. now in, 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 the, in the US gigantic, enormous uh, company. Uh, and sold 10% of the new license for $10 million. And I remember saying to Ted at the time, I said, Ted, you know, if this really takes off, you're, you're going to have to buy that back. And I shudder to think what you're going to have to buy that back for. And he said, like, Roger, like sort of Roger, you moron. Uh, <laughs> the, implied, the implied tone of it is sort yeah. of like, hey, man. I'm now, I'm not just playing with house money, man. I, 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 I've paid this all back and that $10 million is going to, is going to pay for the, pay for the build out to the initial and any kind of network uh, uh, build out and everything. I got nothing, no skin left in, in this, in this game. And I have, and I have 30% uh, kind of share, like, this, you know, mm. third now down, down yeah, the, sure. the third of 90, 90%. And sure enough, I think he had to buy back that stake from Ameritech for, I think, $700 million <laughs> down, down the line. But yeah. Rogers just made a $28 billion acquisition of the, thir the third biggest player in the country. So I don't know what Rogers is worth, 20 or $30 billion. Mm. And the cellular license is probably worth two thirds of that. You know, but did Ted Rogers act like an entrepreneur? Absolutely not. Like he acted more like a grandmother than an entre entrepreneur. But I've seen that more often than not. They figure out how to de-risk the things they're, uh, they're doing so that they don't experience all of the downside and get enough of the upside that everything is just fine. And this is where strategy comes into place, right? It's to, it's to do the thing that has the highest chance of success and the lowest risk of failure at the same time, like at, yeah. at the same Absolutely. time. Is that right? Absolutely. That's what I say. Strategy is an exercise in shortening your odds. 
right? If you just randomly went out and did something, let's say there would be 20, 20 to one chance that you success, uh, succeed. If you do strategy well, it's let's say it's seven to four. Uh, but is it going to succeed? Mm. Nobody knows the future. Nobody. Uh, uh, and so there's always a risk that the future will not sh- uh, you know, take shape the way you hoped it would, you thought it would. Uh, but if you can, if you can shrink the, the, uh, the, those odds against you, uh, then, uh, then if you do it enough times, you will, you will succeed. And that's what Ted Rogers uh, did. Shrunk the odds against him enough and, and he, he you know, died with a net worth of 10 billion or 15 billion or, or, or something in his family's now probably worth 20 billion. And like, I look, uh, just to take the odds analogy, it's, um, which I like, it's the bigger, the bet, the lower, the odds, which you want to, you know, to be, um, like gambling with. Yeah. Like, like if it's going to be a massive, massive bet, you don't want, <laughs> you know, like, um, the odds to be so good that it's triple your money, like that you want it to be super safe. Yeah. And so like you're trying to just kind of reduce those odds um, so that it's as safe a bet as possible. Yeah. Because even if you get a small percentage of it, it's better than to, to lose half or to lose all. Yeah. Though it, the, you know, that, I would agree that most big public companies with a board would have exactly this, the uh, thinking structure that you've described. What they have to understand is it does leave them exposed, right? It leaves them exposed to somebody who says, what the hell, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go try this. And that's, mm. that is, you know, kind of what has changed about business. If people ask me, you know, I started strategy consulting in 1981, if you can mm. believe it, 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, and in that era, if you ask most CEOs of big companies, you know, Dow Jones 30, kind of like just big companies, Fortune 500 type uh, companies, um, they'd be most worried about the competitor who kind of looked like them across the, uh, across the street, mm. kind of coming up with something really clever to outflank them. And they, that would keep them up at, uh, at night. Now, I don't see that at all. They are most worried about two kids in a garage uh, dreaming up something that is going to totally disrupt their, uh, their industry. Now, the problem isn't two kids in a garage. The problem is two kids each in 100 garages. Because if 99 of them have got really dumb ideas and go belly up, lose all their money, Mm. Who cares? It's the one that was doing the same thing the other 99 were doing, but hit on the right idea uh, that will then disrupt you and, and kill and kill the big, the, the big guy, right? That, that could be Google mm. that, uh, that takes all of the advertising that, that used to go to whatever yeah. Time Warner or, 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 or uh, the New York times or whatever. And, mm. and, uh, uh, and so what's happened with the startup culture and the greater amount of financing available for this is there are just more, more kind of troops kind of just keep coming. So you've got the big castle and you've got a yeah. moat around it because you're a big, big company. Yeah. But they just keep they just keep coming and eventually mm-hmm. the moat is full of, of, of full of dead bodies and they walk over walk yeah. over the, the moat and, and then they start scaling the walls and there are just too many of them. And so that's the tricky thing that I think is is created more of a necessity for companies, big companies to say, this may make us nervous, but if we don't do it, one of these little guys is going to do it. Uh, and by the time we figure out that they're, they're, they're succeeding, it may be too late. And, and so I think that's, that's a tension in big business now because boards of directors mm. don't like taking big bets, right? But, you know, if there are going to be a thousand fintech companies coming off after JP Morgan Chase, then 
some of them are going to figure out the answer and JP Morgan Chase isn't going to be able to buy them for a couple billion dollars uh, mm-hmm. by the time it's, it is successful because at that point they'll say, no, uh, you know, you can buy us for $50 billion, not $2 billion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the board of directors of JP Morgan Chase will say, well, we can't afford $50 billion. And, and, uh, but then they, that could be, that could be their death knell. So it's a tricky time for big companies these days. And digital would have just made it harder because the internet and all the kind of like that just changed the economics of business um, and the accessibility. But then also, also not to be underestimated, the huge pools of capital that are now available for those people. So it's the, it's the combination, combination of those, those, those two, those two things. There's a synergy between those two things that are making being a big established player, I think more dangerous than it's been in the, in the past. So should a large company then create a, a department, a subsidiary um, that is made to disrupt that the odds they can be higher because it's higher risk um, in terms of that investment, but it's a lower overall risk to the company because it's not an entire company shift. It's a subsidiary, a segment, a department that is just responsible for the bigger wins. Is that I, I think I think it's a way to do it. I mean, you're 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 essentially giving, as you as you probably know, the now sadly late clay christensen argument of a skunk works you know have mm-hmm. a skunk works that's protected from all those tendencies of of the big company to kind of you know go, oh that's dangerous that's worrisome you do it off in a, a skunk works i think that can work i don't think it's the uh, the only way though I, I mean i think the mainstream of of a uh, of a company can uh just obey some different rules than they, than they have uh, uh, historically. I think, I think you can do it. You can do it both ways. I mean, I think it's up to the CEO to ask the question, can he or she create a set of procedures, rules, ways of operating that enable the mainstream businesses to do that kind of disruptive, disrupt ourselves kind of innovation, mm-hmm. or is that just a bridge too far? And so we have to set up, some form of skunk works, whether that is an owned skunk works, or we make seed investments in a bunch of these, these players yeah. have a, have a seat on the board, get to see yeah. what's going on, get early looks, if not a right of first refusal to buy them. There, yeah. there are different, there are mm-hmm. different ways I think of, of uh, dealing with the, the challenge of uh, small disruptors. Okay. Um, so now we have our, the options, <laughs> We yes. choose one, right? And we're going yes. to go after that one. And we've confirmed it. It could be a subsidiary. Like, it could be like a board. It could be like our own uh, company. Um, it could be everything, right? What is the next step now? So now we need to go after this. What do we need to do to actually win? It's well, the how to win now, right? Is it? Yeah, the, is I, it I think part? it's to it's to deploy what you said you were gonna you're you're gonna do, and then kind of watch and adjust. Um, because so what I say is, is that at that point you should take that little, that little, what would have to be true chart that you made. Yes. So let's say it's option three. Yes. And you go up, you go back and take that thing that the, what would have to be true. You stick it to, to a tack board in front of your desk and every morning come to work and ask, are the things that would have to be true still looking like they're true? And mm-hmm. if the answer is yes, just keep plowing ahead. And if the answer is not really, then you better go through that whole process again. Mm. So strategy, strategy, you should be, you should be kind of comparing what your what the logic of your strategy holds must be true to what is actually happening and assessing the degree to which there's a match. And you should always do that. And that's why you shouldn't do strategy on sort of an annual basis. You know, it's September, so we do strategy as no. You think about strategy every day and you assess the degree to which there's a fit between your strategy and what's going on in the, on, on the market so that you can get at it, uh, get changing it sooner because the biggest problem with kind of strategy tends to be that you get locked into it and then you kind of ignore all the signals that say it's not working the way you thought it was uh, working 
until it's too late to uh, do anything about that. Um, so, so you talk about like to ensure that uh, the capabilities are in place, you know? Mm -hmm. So sometimes in the where to play and how to win, you may not have all the capabilities yet. And so now you need to start investing in creating capabilities that allow you to win in that segment. Yep. Um, and, and that's where planning comes in, right? Now we're planning now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so you should, you should have, you know, if, if you are confident, you can build the capabilities confident enough to say, we're going to, we're going to invest in a strategy for which we do not have all the capabilities. Now we've got a bunch, but we've got a few that we have to build and we think we can build them fast enough. That's when you need to have a plan that says, okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's how much money we're going to spend. Here's who's mm -hmm. going to do what to whom. Here's how long it's going to take. Here's the KPIs for, uh, for that. You will create a plan to build the capabilities necessary to win the way you've chosen to win where you've chosen to play. To and you want to keep checking the what would need to be true. Yeah. daily when you're creating new capabilities to ensure sure. that you're not too far down the path where you're stuck in the strategy and then you realize it's not working, but you've already created or transitioned the organization. And some of those things will be internal and some of them will be external. Mm. What would have to be true is customers will respond this way to the offering we're making. That's an external thing. Uh, we can build the capabilities necessary to have this kind of this kind of you know product or service. That's an internal internal thing. So some of them are external, some of them are internal. But you 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 have to be checking on those on those things because there's a logical structure to the strategy that has to be that has to be confirmed by the world as it evolves, right? Or you've got a, a strategy problem, you've got a fit problem, yeah. right? which is a theory that doesn't fit with the way the world is evolving. When that happens, do you adjust the current strategy or do you go back like one step back to the whole process again? Like uh, where the, is the point the, where the, the, of the no return thing. almost, you know, like it's like yeah, we've yeah. gone this far. Yeah, my, 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 the, the first step I would take in, the, in, the, in that case is to ask, is there a minor alteration to this strategy that we could imagine that would take into account this evolution of the world that is in a different way than we thought? Yeah. So yeah. I, 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 would, I would start there. But if the answer is not a very ready, yeah, yeah, no, we could make this adjustment and things will be fine. Then I would then I would very much go back to okay, we got to go back to square one and and ask okay what's the problem now that we've got to solve? Yeah. Uh, it's this problem of a, mis a kind of a mismatch. On, okay, what would be po possibilities? What where to play? How to win? Change could we could we make? Da, 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 yeah. back, back to the same thing. And this is where that testing stage is so important because it can save you from this part. And like if you weren't sure how much uh, to test. Imagine if you had to get to this stage and then to realize that something that you thought was true was not, and now yeah. you have to, to go back a step or to unwind or to adjust. And so yeah. that's the measure, best argument for doing testing kind of ever. <laughs> measure twice, cut once, right? Isn't that what the, uh, that's what a tailor would say? Yeah. Yes. So just talking about that then, cool. So now, you know, um, we have our capabilities and the plan is in play right? Um, you talk about having the management systems in place. And this was a little bit harder for me to get my head around about how strategy, oh, sorry, about how management systems help with strategy. So could sure. you just unpack that? Now for sure. The audience? sure. And, and maybe and for get... me, by the way, <laughs> for the audience and for me. Yeah, sure. Maybe I'll just give an a, a example. So we all know Four Seasons Hotel chain, right? The world's biggest and most successful luxury hotel uh, chain. So it has a it has a, a strategy of of giving a different form of service. So many people don't realize this, but uh, but Four Seasons Izzy Sh uh, founder Izzy Sharp came to the conclusion that people staying in luxury hotels would rather not be there. Uh, where would they rather be? Number one, at home with their loved ones. Number two, at the office where they can be productive. And number three, in a luxury hotel. Uh, and, uh, and so what he said is, we're going to have a form of service that 
makes up for what you left at home or the office. Our competitors, former services, grand architecture and decor, and more obsequious service, all of which makes you feel less at home. Right? Mm -hmm. So, f f funnily, funnily enough, for that, we need to have frontline workers be able to kind of adjust on the fly and be able to deliver this very customized service to our, our guests. That's the capability we need. Here's the problem. The problem is there's a 70% turnover in the worldwide hotel industry, 70% annual turnover. That means the average person that you meet in a hotel is on their way to a 16 month career in that hotel chain. Wow. So the turnover is just extraordinary. Yeah. So Izzy Sharp says, we can't deliver this kind of service we want that would earn us this great uh, uh, price premium and loyalty that, that, that our strategy needs. Um, doing that. So we'll have a management system that is different or management systems that are different than our competitors. Uh, when we hire, we, the only way you can get a job at a Four Seasons is to complete three successful in-person interviews, the last of which is with a, a, um, the general manager of the hotel in question. Inviolate, if a general manager ever hired somebody without interviewing them, you know, bellhop and, and anybody and any in the four seasons, they'd just be fired on the spot, gone. Uh, kind of that's the management uh, system. Mm -hmm. And when four seasons opens a hotel, because there's they're such great employers, they have on average 400 uh, jobs to fill in an average hotel. Obviously there's bigger and smaller, 400. They get 40,000 applicants on average and they in person interview 4,000 of them to find the 400. Right. So, mm. how on earth can you spend that much time and effort? Your management system says you have to spend that much time and effort. And then they have another management system that is career planning so that everybody knows exactly where they're going in their career in, in four seasons and they get the training for that and all, all of that, all of that stuff. Another management system. Well, if you got 70% turnover, how can you invest like that? It would be insane. Like, just think about it. If the competitor hotels have 400 people per year, 400 full-time positions, 70% turnover, that means they got to hire 280 per year. Mm -hmm. The general manager, and let's say they have to interview two or three people uh, using a four season system to get, get each one of their, their 280, the general manager would be doing nothing but interviewing employees their entire year. Mm. So how on earth do you do that? Well, the answer is four seasons turnover is about 5%. So, right. That, that means that, that, that means 20 new hires per year in that hotel. Mm. That's no problem. Yeah. That's, 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 that's easy. And, and all that investment that you made to figure out what the 400 words is totally worth it because they're on their way to what? 5% turnover equals 20 per 20 year career. Mm. At four seasons. They're worth investing in. Mm. And the competitors are very daunted by this, right? How long would it take us to treat people like Four Seasons treats them and pay them like Four Seasons pays them and have a track record of having great long careers for us to get it from 70 to five so that we could afford those unbelievably expensive management systems, mm. but that aren't so terribly expensive for Four Seasons because... You know, doing that amount of interviewing for a 20 year employee who's going to give awesome service. That's, that's, that's not a big, deal. so there, that's a, that's a set of management systems that builds a distinctive capability that enables them to win where they've chosen to play and meet their winning aspiration to be the gold standard in, in the hotel business worldwide. And there's this whole theory and strategy. There's all sorts of crazy, stupid ass theories and strategy. One is, Oh, the end of competitive advantage. There's no competitive advantage anymore. It's fleeting. It comes and goes easily. Yeah. This has been the four season strategy since the mid eighties. Okay. It's a 40 year old strategy, 40 year old strategy that has produced a, the most successful and the largest luxury hotel chain in the world. Wouldn't you think if there's the end of competitive advantage, you can't keep it anymore. It changes so fast. 
that somebody would have knocked them off yeah. in four decades. No. Mm. And somebody would have knocked off head and shoulders in less, in less than 50 years or, you know, I mean, it's just a stupid ass argument about, mm. about competitive advantages. It cannot be long lived. Competitive advantage can be long lived. If there are unique management systems that build unique capabilities that enable them to win in a particular pl- way in a particular place, uh, there, nothing about the world has made those, those advantages, uh, fleeting or, or, uh, or short anyway, enough of rant on that. No, 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 no. Ar- this ar- is ar- arguments that have, that have no basis in fact. <laughs> no, no, no. Like I love that. And I think I was, so it seems that management systems is how you kind of implement the strategy across the company and it's how you sustain the long-term competitive advantage because the systems will build upon themselves and will continue to grow that capability. So by the time a competitor is actually even aware of it, it's too late because they've already been investing for so long. And that's where management systems is almost, it almost seems like the hardest part because now you are now trying to put strategy throughout the organization by giving people um, kind of authority at certain stages to make certain types of decisions and ensuring that there are certain things that are just, this is how it has to happen here. Right. And it's that combination between the two, like this is how it has to happen, but also there's this area where you can decide. Yep. And not only is it perhaps the hardest part, it's the most boring part. Yeah. It's the, most- <laughs> right? it's, it, it really is. It's, yeah. it is like the plumbing, but, but you're, you, you know, you're very, you're very perceptive, right. Which is, which is that, yes, it's that, it's that sort of boring plumbing that often is absolutely at the heart of, of competitive advantage. Uh, mm. and, and, and four seasons is a, is a, is a good case, uh, in point. And you'd think, right? You'd think that somebody would be able to say, "Oh no, we can do that too," but it's quite daunting. It's quite daunting because, because of, uh, in part of again what you said, uh, very uh, once again perceptive. It's it's by the time they figure it out, in some sense, you've moved a long way. So by the time competitors sort of figured out, wow, Four Seasons just has this built-in service advantage. Their, their guests just like their service way more. And, oh, it's because it's not sort of obsequious and grand art, backed by grand art. It, it's, this, it's this feel of customization and hominess plus sort of the efficiency of being, being at, at the office. And so we have to get employees like that too. Oh, dear. <laughs> uh, you, know, you know, Four Seasons has now got a track record of having these long lived employees who have these long and productive careers and work up through this, the, the system. And so we'd have to go out and convince people that even though we're not four seasons and we have no track record whatsoever at this, we are going to be able to treat you just like four seasons uh, does. And then the, the person just sort of says, well, I could speculate with you or get the real thing at four seasons. Mm. Uh, you know, do I have idiot written across my face? Yeah. So, so yeah. it's not four seasons is no longer where they were when they started. They're 20 years down the path mm. of having that system work and produce these outputs. And so, so you're the company that's going at, at, after them is not, does not have sort of a fair start. Yeah. They're literally running a race where they start 20 years behind, behind you when they run and they, really fast. But <laughs> and they need their own strategy now to be able to compete against Four Seasons because now they're the market leader and now they're the one that have the moat, right? And now they're the one that have to defend, you know, like against the million or the hundreds of con- um, competitors that are trying t- to knock them yeah. down, even c- outside of the Airbnb experience. And that was something out completely from the side. Um, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Um, which, and- which is a good example of how, you know, you can, you know, you've always got to be, got to be kind of watching for, for other kinds of competition, right? Mm. When you're the market leader, like four seasons, you're probably, if, as long as you don't get, you know, lazy and arrogant, 
uh, it's going to be hard for somebody who's like you to catch up. But what you have to be worried about is somebody who's got a very different way of delivering a, a customer need. Mm. Now, the customer need that Four Seasons meets first and foremost is, is the busy high-end business traveler, and they're not going to be your Airbnb people. Yeah. Now, of course, Four Seasons has all sorts of resorts. It's hotels and resorts. But the people who stay at those resorts tend to be the same, same. business travelers who already love, love Four Seasons. So they're a little more insulated from Airbnb than Hilton or Marriott or, or, or whatever I would, I would argue. But your point is a good one, which is competition Competition comes in all forms, uh, and as long as they want your customer, your customer. The, fact that they aren't, they, the fact that they aren't like you does not mean that they can't make your customers happy in a different way than, uh, than you've made them. I am conscious of time, so I'm going to ask this one more question about strategy, and I don't know if this is going to be a hard one or not, but sure. like, it could be a simple one, but let me just ask it anyway. Um, how do you measure strategy is it just the um the business metrics is that how you measure strategy is it just kind of the standard things that we see like in you know the, the financial reports is i i prefer so so the way i'll i'll i'll, I'll answer this slightly slightly elliptically right the first box in in my choice cascade is what's your winning aspiration so what I say is in that box, you've got to say what your aspiration is and have that aspiration translated into goals that you will measure yourself by. Now, there are good goals and bad goals. The good goals are goals that are consistent with the strategy, right? Mm. So if, if, you, if your four seasons and your strategy uh, means uh, giving the guests an experience that makes up for what they left at home or at the office, you better have a goal to have customers kind of love your, your, your experience and have high customer satisfaction. If that isn't a way you're measuring yourself, then you're probably just fooling yourself on, on, the, that, on that being your win. So you got to figure mm -hmm. out figure out what the strategy requires and have, and have goals that are, that are consistent with, uh, uh, with that, that having been said, I, I don't, there's not a sort of particular, this goal or that goal is, is great. Other than I, I do believe, as I said before, that where you've chosen to play, you don't want to be second, right? You want to be more prominent than any of your competitors where you've, where you've chosen uh, uh, to play. But if I step back and just ask, ask, what do I think makes for a successful business long-term? Mm -hmm. Like why is Southwest Airlines successful very long-term, 50 years of, of success? Why is Procter & Gamble successful for, for so long? Why is Four Seasons successful for long -term? I, I believe that that it's because they have human friendly systems. By that I mean there are no people in their system that are being exploited, so that they're succeeding by exploiting uh, someone. Costco would be another uh, example of a long term. Blah, blah, blah. They treat their customers with respect their employees with care, their suppliers with a relationship kind of a aspect, the environment uh, with, with respect. Hmm. Those are all things that, that I think make, uh, uh, make a business strategy more resilient over the long term because there's nobody out there other than their competitors who would lust after their position uh, who say, I'd like to, I'd like to take those people down, right? Their employees aren't saying, I wish this company would start mm. failing because mm. they're treating me like crap for seasons. They're like, you know, crazy employees are like, I love my company. This is great. You know, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful place. Their suppliers say, say the same things, the places in which they operate, uh, say the same thing. The people who own the hotels, Four Seasons just manages them. The people who own them make a lot of money because they treat them with respect. That's, that's a feature of strategy that I think gets underplayed. And so people will say, oh, we're going to measure it by how much shareholder value we create. Good, good luck to you on that, 
Mm. This gets back to this gets back to Aristotle. My one of my favorite people, Peter Drucker and, and Aristotle are probably my favorite two thinkers in in the history of the world. And Aristotle, way back twenty four hundred years ago, yeah. you know, said that if if a no in those days they only talked talk, talked about men, but uh, this would apply to women as well. But he said yeah. if a man sets out uh, in life to be happy, he's not likely to end up happy. If instead a man sets uh, sets out to lead, lead a a good life by which he meant sort of a life of servitude uh, to his his fellow his fellow uh, uh, citizens, he's likely to end up happy. Mm. That's what I believe about about companies companies that are trying to make the world a better place by being good to the rest of humanity. I think are more likely to create shareholder value than the companies that say our job is to create shareholder value mm. because who jumps out of bed, who leaps out of bed in the morning? <laughs> I'm going to work to create shareholder value. <laughs> Nobody. What yeah. customer wants to be supplied by somebody who they know they, their, their only interest in life is creating shareholder value. This is mm. not motivational. This does not help the company uh, uh, succeed being a, a great company being Costco, right? A retailer in the United States who, for whom minimum wage is completely irrelevant, right? They, the, the lowest paid people at, at Costco make over 20 bucks an hour, about $22 an hour mm. when minimum wage in some of their jurisdictions is nine or $10 an hour. And you could say, how could you possibly, and they're a club store right there in the low, low price mm -hmm. tier. How could you just, but like, twice as much for all the people? Mm -hmm. how, how can this possibly be? You know, Jim Senegal, founder of Costco would say, easy, easy, right? Like I want, I want my workers to not be worrying about putting food on the table, you know, paying their, paying their, uh, their, their mortgage. I want them to come to work excited by life, excited by the possibilities. That's by the way, why I don't hire any outsiders into management. They all come up from within. So anybody who starts at 22 bucks an hour can end up being, being the CEO of, of, of the company. Yeah. Like he's got a view of how to make the whole system work for everybody. And guess what, right? He's the most, you know, one of the very most successful retailers in the entire uh, country doing things that people would say can't be done. You cannot pay twice for your employees what it costs everybody. This is retailing, guys. This is people, clerks, checkout, cashiers. You cannot do that. Mm. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. And in fact, I've been only been doing it for about 30 years and beating all of you. So having that, having that more expansive view of how to have a system work for everybody, I think is, is the key to having a great strategy. I think that's a good point to finish on because um, I am conscious of time. I could keep talking about this. Um, so if there was one thing that you would want the listeners to do, like one side, like one book to look at, uh, subscribe somewhere, uh, what should they do? Well, I mean, how about three things? If, mm -hmm. if you're interested in, 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 in the subject here, I, I did write a book with A.G. Laffley, the then CEO of P&G called Playing to Win. I think that's a worthwhile book. Fantastic uh, to, book. I have to say that is such a good strategy book. And it's written in a way which is easy to, to, to read and understand because I also have the book Competitive Strategy, Complicated, Technical. Yes. Yes. I really yes. love your book because I was like, ah, all right, I get it. Thank so, you. Yeah. So do so do that. If you if if you're a real nerd, and after that you want more, my medium series. So I, I I've, I'm writing a series. I'm on my 26th straight week mm. writing a medium piece uh, called "Playing to Win: Practitioners' Insights" that are that are supposed to be for practitioner uh, uh, some insights on on strategy. And just go on medium and 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 look for "Playing to Win," and you'll see you'll see it all. They're all uh, linked back to that. And if you want still more, just go to my website, which is www.rogerlmartin. My middle initial is l.com. Uh, and there's a whole section on strategy there with probably, oh, geez, there'd be over 100 articles I've written on, on strategy uh, there. And you can just sort of leaf through them and see what uh, strikes your fancy. So those would be the, the, the things that I would, I would say are, are nice follow-ups follow to this. Um, 
and on that point, um, the links will be in the show notes and this content is highly recommended. Yeah. Like this is for anybody that wants to be better in business, understanding how to think about strategy, which is a thinking activity is key. Um, and the content from Roger is fantastic. Yeah. There's not many times where I'm saying it's such good content, but this is amazing stuff. And the medium series is free. So if you just want to get started like super easy, just check it out. Um, there's some fantastic concepts in there as well. Roger. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. It's been fun talking about strategy and thinking about how to win. Thank you so much for coming today. Hey, it, it really was a pleasure. You, you, uh, it, you really know a lot about strategy and it was fun to have the conversation anytime. That means a lot to me coming from someone like you. Thank you so much, Roger. Not at all. Take care. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Growth Manifesto podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, please give us a five-star rating on iTunes. For more episodes, please visit growthmanifesto.com forward slash podcast. And if you need help driving growth for your company, please get in touch with us at webprofits.io.